Well, I think you could say that only certain philosophical ideas become law on the international scene. It is, um, let's say, international order cannot afford constant philosophical disagreement about things, although I'm sure it, it exists, for example, nowadays between the Western countries on the one hand and Russia and China on the other hand, their disagreements are also disagreements of political philosophy. But you could say that, that law and states, when they, do, when they make international law, they, they see what kind of ideas that are always philosophical ideas can get this kind of consensus that whatever protects their interests and, and then can be called law. Generally, international law in many ways grows out of philosophy. When you read the founding uh, foundational texts and thinkers of, of, of international law, like Hugo Grotius in the 17th century, these are, you know, you could also say that they are philosophers of history and, and moral philosophers of morality, uh, except that they make this distinction that they, they say at some point, I'm not only moralizing, but I'm also you know, this is, has this kind of consensus that it can be called uh, law. But this also means then that, that these ideas that are approved as law can of course change over, over time. So for example, in the 19th century when you had uh, monarchies in Europe, they had a principle of legitimacy, which they thought that, you know, every, every monarchy must be protected and defended and they thought it was a legal slash moral slash philosophical slash religious principle all, all somehow uh, together and today we basically don't remember this this principle almost uh, although the russian foreign minister sergey lavrov after the annexation of crimea made the case in the un general assembly that all uh, seizures of power or coup d'etat should be declared you know illegal which is which is a little bit similar to russia's position in the 19th century which is that old order must be defended yanukovych must be protected, not the revolutionaries on the street. But we, what, what I guess philosophy students uh, should know as a basic thing about international law is, is that the, the, the doctrine of international law has its starting point, the doctrine of sources. And uh, let's say for us, the, the sources are not just book of wise, books of wise people, but, but they are treaties, customary law, general principles of law and, uh, and to some extent also uh, international court, court cases as well as opinions of, of most high, highly acclaimed um, publicists. And that is somehow consensual, usually accepted, but that means we look, in, as a first thing, we look in, in treaties. We, we detect what, what has got recognition, at least nowadays, as international law in treaties. Well, this is the interesting thing. I think that in the 19th century, for example, in Germany and Italy, when, you know, this is a very big issue, the defining issue for these places, can, you know, all German speakers be united in one, one state or, or all Italian um, speakers? Um, they call it at the time the principle of nationality. And, and then there is a debate uh, about whether this is a political principle, as they call it. In other words, not really law. Maybe important, maybe very relevant, but not accepted as, as law, as you can claim it and then you, you know, can have it. And, uh, and then at some point, so this, this boils on in the, in the textbooks of international law of the second half of the 19th century. They discuss what is the, what is the role of the nationality principle. And they they, um, you know, acknowledge that it is apparently a very important political principle, at least for some places. But uh, the first caveat is that at that time they do not necessarily extend it for the outer European world, because this is not recognized as, as equal to Europe in terms of international legal principles. 
So even if, you know, some liberal philosopher in, in, in England might discuss the principle of self-determination favorably um, as a political principle, he doesn't necessarily assume that this applies to India. And um, so it, it, you could say that before 1918, it is this, there are those contradictions, but ultimately the, the common ground seems to be that it is somehow a political principle that is knocking at the door of those empires uh, and they kind of grudgingly accept that okay this happened now in Italy, this happened now in Germany but they of course don't want it to happen let's say to Poland, Baltic provinces, I don't know, Wales, um, Czech, Czech, Czechoslovakia and those places. I assume that that few people, few scholars, have attempted, at least in international law, to to really you know define it because all these definitions they tend to be you know contested and and I, it's it's international lawyers are a pragmatic bunch in the sense that they they know that they would be you know bad philosophers. They would be amateur philosophers, so they are more moving in the realm of, of you know, states, whatever interests, what can be, what can be agreed upon. And and I think we know instinctively that states will never agree on a definition of what people is. So I guess there is some sort of practical working definition in international law that we know it when we see it, but it's difficult. And I mean, let's let's take a concrete example. Uh, this famous Catalonia now of the last last case, last years, I think there is a very big debate actually between Madrid and 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 Catalonian independentists about you know what is what is a people and how 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 is this to be uh, defined you know who has the right to decide on Catalonia's fate. Uh, actually, there, some aspects of it remind me of the end of the Soviet Union because one of the last arguments that Mikhail Gorbachev made was, was to say that, yes, we are in favor of self-determination, but we can never do it like this, that we just ask people in that, let's say, in Armenia. It's, the, all Soviet people must be, must be asked about this. So this is the people. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is not the predominant understanding. I think the predominant understanding is that, yes, Armenians are... A, different people than, for example, Russians or Tatars or Estonians. Um, but what is, uh, what is maybe also has blurred the picture is, is that in the process of decolonization um, in places like Africa, basically very multi-ethnic, um, multi-tribal, if you want, uh, nation states emerged. And these places are not interested, or these capitals, these governments, they are not interested in, in let's say, the fragmentation of, of these nation states. And therefore, they try to say that, you know, you are Nigerian, whatever, you, whatever language you speak. Because if you, if you go back to this older European uh, doctrines, you know, of Herder and those, those people, they would say that, you know, each Nigerian language, maybe there's a separate Volksseele somewhere. So maybe in the end, you know, instead of Nigeria, there should be, you know, 115 uh, some sort of units. And, and somehow, well, basically no one is interested in that. At least in these forces that control today's making and interpretation of international law. Well, I guess it's so that 1918 was really the revolutionary moment for, for the principle of self-determination as part of Wilson's 14 points. And I guess you could say that really it, it managed to change the political map in Europe, especially in its eastern part when, you know, Poland and Czechoslovakia and, and these places were not there and suddenly they were there as well as the Baltic states, of course. But I think even Wilson didn't necessarily think of it as an ordering principle for, for, for the whole world. 
or we don't know enough about whether he did or not. In any case, we, we can take this, what he said, as a direct criticism, for example, of the British Empire, that, you know, now Britain should apply this principle and they, these places should all become independent. The time is somehow not ready for that. So in a way, to simplify, we could say that 1918 means self-determination to Europe, at least parts of Europe. And 1966 is simply the kind of ideological, moral justification for decolonization in the context of international law. And these are the two common and identical articles. One of the two UN Human Rights Covenants of 1966 that both treaties start with, with, uh, with emphasizing the principle of self-determination and only then come, let's say, individual individual rights. And I think, I think the main message of this is simply that decolonization had to happen, must happen, and is the right thing. So in this sense, this principle becomes uh, universal if you, if you want. But again, it becomes, as I tried to say before, it, it becomes uni universal, but, but to certain administrative units that existed before, that, that it's not considered that uh, that Europeans basically governed without taking into account so directly, you know, ethnic and tribal borders, which very often were also very messy. And then, uh, so, so it was not the same logic for the African self-determination as was applied in, let's say, Estonia and Latvia. It's an area that we, in our, let's say, Eurocentricism, to some extent, we, we sometimes don't know enough. But, but basically, I think if you, if you would go around the world, which I haven't done endlessly either, but, you know, basically, Argentinians still have a problem with, uh, with uh, Falkland or Malvinas Islands. So basically what these countries criticize, or, 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 or in the Indian Ocean, there are, there are you know, little spots of island that are actually controlled by countries like France and the United States. So neighboring countries often see these issues as residual issues of colonialism. They say that there is no reason why, you know, UK should have islands somewhere very, very far away from its, its mainland. But these are also, also interesting questions of international law and conflict of, interna of the basically different principles in international law, because quite often uh, countries like the UK or the US or France, they can refer to treaties when their status has been, you know, uh, recognized that they say, but we are here under, under international law. But, but in the long run, so, so I would say it's not completely concluded. So, for example, did you know that, that in, for example, beside the territorial sea that is attached to the mainland of countries, there is also, of course, if you control islands in the, in the world oceans, then these, these are also have territorial seas and exclusive economic zones. For example, France has one of the largest exclusive economic zones in the world mm. because of that fact, because of having those islands, as has, as has the UK. So, so in order to understand, let's say, the political economy and, and military situation in today's world, it's not just enough to look at the map of Europe, but you have to actually see who controls the sea lanes mm. and who has their military there. And these are all international law issues that some of the neighboring countries tend to, you know, contest. I mean, the, the critical left anyway says that we still live in the era of colonialism, but just we don't call it like that. It's, it's just a neo something. It's, it's a longer story, of course, but, but some key points would be that Russia knows that one of the promoters, you know, so when we talk about 1918, we, it would be fair not only to speak of, of um, you know, Woodrow Wilson, but also Vladimir Lenin. So, so compared to older Tsarist approaches, which would have, you know, denied these kind of possibilities, of course, Lenin's approach was, was different. He, whether it was tactical, uh, as I would argue, or, or, or some sort of long-term 
thing inside, but he did kind of make concessions to this principle and therefore also helped to change the course of the 20th century. Mm, so Russian interpreters of international law, they know all of it. And they actually, as, as the Soviet Union in, in its rhetoric, sided with the third world against uh, the Western world in the context of self-determination. So this was part of it that uh, Moscow has a favorable attitude to self-determination. But of course, the price for that was, uh, was hypocrisy in the sense that they, it could only be said, but, but in our realm, the problem of self-determination is solved. It doesn't exist. And then others would, would come and, 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 you know, I don't know, criticize the situation that perhaps it's not so, so uh, completely solved in your national republics or so. And after the disintegration of, of the Soviet Union, I think Russian elites perceived the principle of self-determination as a threat. They said that this is how this is how basically territorial integrity gets damaged. So example, Chechnya. Uh, and this is where Russia drew the red line, said that, okay, the national republics, they can go. They were units in a, in a, in a federation of ours, but they drew the red line. If you were part of the Russian Federation proper, as Chechnya, for example, was, they wouldn't let it happen, or Tatarstan. And then, uh, so, the general idea has been, uh, in the last 20 years, putting limits to self-determination, finding rather arguments in defense of state sovereignty and territorial integrity. But of course, then the contradiction comes that with this ex post facto uh, justification of the annexation of Crimea, that this somehow was, was also related to, to self-determination, of course, realist thinkers, including our countrymen, Rein Müllerson, they, they kind of between the lines, even if they make pro-Russian arguments, they would say that this is, a, this is really more of a pretext that the real reasons for the annexation of Crimea that were of military and geostrategic nature. So in this sense, what people want was, was kind of used for gaining a certain tract of geostrategically valuable land. I think in our neighborhood, we, we kind of tend to feel that Russia is the main actor who kind of behaves like that in international law, kind of picking and choosing what is useful to you. But I think the reality is, is, is in this sense more complex that to different degrees, everybody does that a little bit. So this, is, this cannot be completely prohibited. It has, you know, there's a human psychology behind that, why we, and, uh, and states, why they, you know, make their cases so that it's in, in their favor. So the price for that simply is that, you know, Russia, uh, it, it, there are those contradictions. The, the, the philosophy, the main really philosophy are, are rather interests of the Russian state. And these interests of the Russian state, as Moscow defines it, are, are of course different in, in Caucasus, when Russia maybe even today plays this divide et impera role of classical empires, how you also, when smaller uh, peoples are, are having quarrels with each other, then you, you know, put a bit more um, fuel to the fire and, 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 you know, can maybe hurt your enemy, which I see is the main, uh, main reason for supporting Abhazia and South Ossetia. And, you know, it's, if you want to weaken the European Union, for example, which also has been nasty to Russia in some other ways, then, you know, perhaps it's a, a smart political move to, I don't know, su support separatists, which Russia, of course, condemns very much for Russia proper. And there is a special, there are spe there is special legislation and criminal code for extremists and separatists and all, all that. So I guess that, but, but, but we, we, at least how we lawyers try to escape it, because if one would conclude with this, then one would inevitably conclude that all world is just only political and there are just interests and, and uh, how, we, how we lawyers try to protect ourselves from this simply is to, first of all, to say that not everything what happens in the political world for different ideas and interests, of course, cannot be directly regulated by law and law is a separate field and different, not, not all political claims, even if they have, end up being successful in practice are, are, are necessarily and directly, you know, valid in law. So there is, I guess for, for most of international legal thinking, there is uh, 
there is some sort of understanding that, that these are not identical areas and sometimes you also have to live with situations of illegality, for example. <laughs>